Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're just about a minute before 1 o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, do my introductions and get started because we have a lot of material to cover today. Uh, my name is Kelly Mead. I'm the Director of HR here at Axiom Human Resource Solutions. And today we're going to do a 30-minute training on sexual harassment. Um, I'm going to try and keep it to 30 minutes, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, do all questions at the end. So if you have a question, Type it in the chat section, and I will get all the questions at the end and stick around until everything has been answered. Okay. I want to make sure everybody's muted here so um, nobody can hear you. And let's see here. I'm going to email everybody the slides after the presentation. I couldn't find a way to upload them, so I will shoot everybody, everybody an email who's attending so you'll get these slides after the, the WebEx. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. If you have any trouble hearing me, go ahead and, and type in the chat box and let me know. I tested it and I think we're doing okay. So let's get started. Okay, so today's learning objectives, we're going to talk about um, the definition of sexual harassment. I'm also going to explain the two different types of sexual harassment. I'm going to outline the importance and benefits of preventing sexual harassment in the workplace. I'm also going to discuss your responsibilities as a supervisor or manager, and also explain why it's so important for you to have a sexual harassment policy, and also give you an idea of what that policy should include. So I want to start off by pointing out how often sexual harassment happens and also how much it's costing companies as well as the victims of sexual harassment. So the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or the EEOC, they had a select task force set up to study sexual harassment in the workplace. And their 2016 study found that 25 to 85% of women have experienced harassment on the job. Now that's a pretty big uh, variance there, and the variance counts for 25% was when they gave no explanation to the respondents on what sexual harassment meant, but then when they gave specific behaviors, that number jumped to as high as 85%, which is actually astounding. That actually surprised me. Also, a recent poll by business insider partner MSN revealed that one in three people, which translates to 31% of workers, have experienced sexual harassment on the job. And the group that has experienced the most sexual harassment are women aged 30 to 44. And out of that demographic, 49% have experienced sexual harassment on the job, which is huge. And also an online survey, which was launched in January by uh, an organization called Stop Street Harassment. This was in response to the Me Too movement. Um, they found that 81% of women and 43% of men have experienced some form of sexual harassment during their lifetime. When you talk about the cost, the EEOC, same uh, select task force that we talked about, they found that since 2010, employers have paid out $700 million in damages to employees resulting from various forms of harassment. The EEOC itself has collected $47 million in monetary benefits just in 2016 for sexually harassed employees. And there's also financial consequences to the target of sexual harassment. Um, it, it's difficult to measure because uh, not all of their financial losses are reported, but a lot of times people who are harassed incur additional medical expenses due to stress-related conditions. They end up quitting their job, taking a, a pay cut just to get out of the company, or they end up changing professions altogether. So the victims themselves are losing uh, financially as well. Sexual harassment is a, is a costly epidemic, and I just don't think we can talk about it too much until uh, we solve this problem. So the EEOC, 
or the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, they're actually the federal agency that enforces um, sexual harassment law, basically. And its definition of sexual harassment is unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors and other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature constitute sexual harassment when this conduct explicitly or implicitly affects an individual's employment, unreasonably interferes with an individual's work performance, or creates an intimidating, hostile, or offensive work environment. Even if the behavior is unwelcome, an individual may not complain out of fear or embarrassment or shame. So it's important that uh, we take preventative measures and, and train our staff and, and managers especially to identify unwelcome behavior. And behaviors can range from harmful joking to physical abuse. What defines something as sexual harassment depends on whether the behavior is unwelcome to the target or others. And unwelcome behavior is simple because it's not wanted by the offended person. And what you may think is friendly can be interpreted as offensive by someone else. So a lot of times when I talk about the definition of harassment by the EEOC, the term unwelcome seems uh, unnecessary because it's assumed if it's sexual harassment, it's unwelcome. And that's not necessarily the case. If you take a situation where there are two people having maybe an inappropriate conversation and a third person stumbles across that conversation and hears it, it might be sexual harassment to the third party, but if the behavior in the conversation was not unwanted between the two people, then it wouldn't constitute harassment. Now, it might be inappropriate for the workplace and still uh, require disciplinary action, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's, uh, it's automatically sexual harassment. That unwanted is a very key part of the definition. So there are two types of sexual harassment. The first is called quid pro quo, and the second is called hostile work environment. So quid pro quo, this is basically you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Uh, the term is Latin for this for that, or one thing for another. This is considered the more straightforward or blatant type of sexual harassment because it's typically spelled out, hey, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you. It can be a supervisor who abuses their authority and promises an employee a promotion in exchange for sexual favors. It could be a situation where a supervisor demotes an employee for refusing a date. Um, it can also be that an employee is fired after ending a relationship with a supervisor. The, the dynamics of the quid pro quo type of sexual harassment involve power. So this is typically a relationship where one party has power over another and it has to do with work-related decisions, like they can hire, fire, promote, raises. So um, that's sort of the dynamic with quid pro quo. It happens, it, it, it's prevalent, but it's not the most common type. The most common type is hostile work environment. And this is a work environment that has become hostile or threatening due to repeated unwelcome behaviors that have a sexual focus. So these are things like sexually explicit talk or emails, sexually provocative images, comments on physical attributes, inappropriate touching, gossip. Of course, that list is not all inclusive. Again, to be considered harassment, this behavior has to be unwelcome. And I do want to mention that the term hostile work environment is frequently misused. It's actually a, a legal term that's specific to sexual harassment and other types of harassment and discrimination. And I hear employees use that a lot when there's some sort of situation where they're dissatisfied or they feel um, uncomfortable or they're just not happy with something. You, you might have an employee come to you and use hostile work environment. So don't panic. Um, listen to what they have to say. It doesn't necessarily mean sexual harassment because I hear it misused all the time. So one of the most common questions that I get is, can a one-time incident be considered sexual harassment? Well, the answer is yes. Most of the time it is no. Um, but typically in quid pro quo type cases, it would be a yes because, again, that's a very blatant type of sexual harassment where 
somebody is spelling out what they want from you. So that is usually, uh, that can be a one-time incident. The hostile work environment usually requires a pattern of repeated behavior or proof of a, a you know, a pattern of, of a person doing something over and over. But if it's something really outrageous, a single incident can be considered hostile work environment. You know, if someone touches someone else inappropriately or, um, you know, sends an extremely offensive picture, those sorts of things. So it, it can happen in a one-time incident. It's not usually what I encounter. Um, but a lot of times what people call me with, it's just bad behavior and it's, uh, it should be addressed through disciplinary action so it doesn't become sexual harassment. Ideally, we want to prevent sexual harassment from occurring at all. Um, you know, Benjamin Franklin said an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and I tend to agree. Uh, you know, it's easier to stop these things from happening before they come, become problematic. And in today's business climate, you know, we can't really turn on the television. We still have a steady stream of high-profile sexual harassment cases being thrown at us, you know, on a, on a daily, weekly basis. Um, so, you know, this is in people's head right now. They're looking for this. Um, so it's, it's more important than ever to take measures to, to prevent this from happening. And the successful sexual harassment settlement against your company, it can put you out of business, plain and simple. If you're a small company um, and there is a major judgment against you and it's beyond anything that you have insurance coverage for, or, I mean, it can, it can greatly affect your livelihood. So this is very important. And unaddressed harassment typically becomes more severe over time, and it's more difficult to address and correct. So if we can stop it before it even gets to that point, that's ideal. And, you know, basically sexual harassment can be one of the most destructive forces in the, in the workplace. Um, it negatively affects everyone. It's felt throughout the whole organization. So it should really be a priority to, to take measures to prevent this from happening. Some of the consequences and benefits, um, you know, of, of taking action to prevent sexual harassment. If you don't do that, you might face fines, legal fees, judgments, or restitution. You also might incur penalties for not meeting legal requirements. If you have a, a sexual harassment complaint filed against you and you have, whether it's the EEOC or you have lawyers, digging through your materials and your records and you're not meeting your uh, training requirements if you live in california connecticut or maine you have training requirements for sexual harassment so it can bring things to light that you have not been in compliance with as well personal liability and criminal charges can be brought against sexual harassers depending on the situation so that can be a very serious matter it can also result in high turnover and a lack of talent for your organization because you will gain a reputation of being somewhere that is uh, not a healthy place to work. You will also have an unproductive work environment and reduced employee engagement. Some of the benefits of preventing sexual harassment, of course, your employees have peace of mind. They feel like, hey, company and, the company and management care about my well-being. It fosters a culture of respect and professionalism. It also enhances your reputation as an employer. It creates a level of transparency. It nurtures open discussion among staff as well as with leadership. And it promotes trust between management and employees. It also endorses equitable treatment of all and reduces your risk. So what are the things that we can do to prevent sexual harassment? Well, first off, I recommend having a zero tolerance harassment policy and enforcing it. That's key. I would also recommend regularly training your employees and managers. I recommend in-person training. Statistically, when it comes to uh, sexual harassment training, studies show that face-to-face -face training works best as opposed to online modules that you might do or uh, book training or, or, you know, other forms of electronic training in person is, is uh, it works the best. And, you know, depending on what type of industry you're on, you're in, if you're, if you're a restaurant or in the retail industry, very high uh, number of complaints of sexual harassment in those industries, you might want to do your training every year with your employees. There's also high turnover in those industries, so you probably need to 
do that every year to catch all the new people. But if you're in an industry like real estate or insurance or education, you may only want to do those in-person trainings ever every two to three years because there are not nearly as many instances of sexual harassment in those industries. Also, I encourage open discussion to clarify and answer questions. Um, I'm a, a huge fan of, you know, taking cases that are in the news and talking about them with your staff. And this doesn't have to be something that, you know, is uh, 45 minutes long. This can be a five minute discussion. Hey, did you hear on the news about this, this or this? How would we have handled that according to our company policy? Or what do you all think about that? How did they handle that poorly? What could they have done better? It's a great exercise to keep that topic in your employees' heads and also get them thinking about your policy and how to apply it to real life situations. I would also suggest training your managers and supervisors to, uh, on how to observe problematic behavior and then also train them how to address and investigate sexual harassment claims so they can prevent situations from escalating. And also uniformly enforce your sexual harassment policy. A uh, uniform enforcement of all policies will help you if you end up in a legal battle. Um, and it will also send a message to your employees that everybody is subject to the same rules and everybody will be clear on what behaviors um, are not tolerated. So when we're talking about prevention, again, I really uh, push for extra training for uh, managers and supervisors because they have added responsibilities to your employees and they also uh, bring more liability to your company if they don't do um, what they're supposed to do. So let's talk about that a little bit. A manager or supervisor, if someone reports sexual harassment to a manager or supervisor, even informally, it is considered an official complaint to the company. So I hear a lot, people will say, well, you know, Judy told me about a situation that she's not very comfortable with, um, but she doesn't want to make a big deal out of it. So, I, you know, she doesn't officially want to report it. She just kind of told me about it. Well, if you're a manager or a supervisor and she kind of told you about it, it's been reported. So it is your responsibility as a supervisor or manager to take action um, based on whatever your policy lays out um, you need to escalate that complaint and start investigating. And if you don't, and that whole situation escalates from a lawsuit backwards, that's going to look really, really bad on your company if it was reported and nobody did anything about it. Supervisors must act promptly to investigate and take corrective action. Absolutely. Supervisors should know your company policy regarding harassment and what steps to take. It's also important that, you know, you follow your company's policy as well during uh, a situation like this. And proper investigation techniques must be utilized by supervisors to sort through all the facts. And corrective action must be consistent and adhere to your company's policy. So liability when it comes to your managers and supervisors. Employers are automatically liable for harassment by a supervisor that results in negative employment action like demotion, termination, failure to promote. Um, yeah, right. Automatically, if the supervisor does that, you're going to, to be liable for that. Employers are also liable for harassment by non-supervisor employees if a supervisor was aware. The EEOC looks at an entire investigation, and if the employer, the employer can be held liable if the supervisor didn't handle it correctly. So again, if, if the situation escalates and the EEOC is requesting records and they're digging through uh, your files and they find out that something was reported to a supervisor and no action was taken, that's going to hurt you. Your mid-level supervisors typically impact the day-to-day -day operations more than the higher levels of management. So they can make or break your company's defense in this situation. And what I find is that a lot of times first level managers and supervisors, they don't really have the knowledge and skills that your higher managers do. A lot of times they uh, are pretty low down the food chain. They might make a couple dollars more an hour than the people that they're supervising. And they were promoted because they did a good job at what they did, not because they were trained as a supervisor or manager. So it's really important that the people who are handling the day-to-day -day things are familiar with your policy and what steps to take if they do receive a complaint or observe bad behavior. 
So why have a sexual harassment policy? Well, first off, it's the company's responsibility to provide its employees with a safe environment, which is free of harassment. Uh, also, it helps prevent sexual harassment from occurring in the first place. It lets your managers and employee know, employees know what's expected of them. It spells out behaviors that will not be tolerated. It lets your managers and employees know what steps they can take if sexual harassment has occurred, and it will also reduce your risk and liability to have a policy in place, especially if you can show that you've been following it. So what should you have in a strong sexual harassment policy? Well, the first thing is you should have, it, have an objective. And you wanna state the purpose of the policy you want to talk about the commitment of the company to provide employees with a harassment-free, healthy environment. You want to state that all employment decisions are based on knowledge, skills, and abilities without any regard to any protected class because um, the protected class of sex under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is, is where sexual harassment falls in terms of the law. So um, you want to, want to have that included in the policy. I would also recommend talking about the scope of the policy, and that means it applies to all workers of all levels at every location, even if you have off-site locations. You might also further explain that the scope of the policy covers uh, harassment by third parties, like vendors, customers, clients, visitors, anybody that an employee might encounter when they are performing the essential functions of their job, if they have an outside party that they deal with all the time, that policy applies to them as well. If that employee is being harassed by that person who is not an employee, the policy would still apply, the complaint procedure would still apply, and you would still take action. I would also recommend the definition of sexual harassment, not just what the EEOC says, but also something simplified so everybody can understand it. I would list examples of sexual harassment and also prohibited conduct. You can put a list and of, co of course state that it's not all inclusive, but you can put things like um, requests for sexual favors, unwanted physical contact, sexual innuendos, suggestive comments, objects or pictures, uh, physical aggression, just a, a list so people can look at it and say, okay, I know what happened to me, it fits into this list, so this is sexual harassment. It's also really important to have a section where you explain how to respond if the, the, the policy has been violated or if uh, someone feels that sexual harassment has taken place. You want to include a detailed description of the steps that employees and also supervisors should take if they believe they've been the subject of sexual harassment or that they've witnessed sexual harassment. Also include any kind of contact information, whether that be your HR department if you have one, or some companies have an outside like third-party vendor that will take their uh, sexual harassment complaint. There might be a special email or a hotline set up, any kind of contact info. Give them as much information as you can, uh, especially an email address or something. If they don't want to do it face-to-face, -face, I, would, I would recommend giving your employees some sort of avenue where they can contact you and not have to speak to you because sometimes there's a fear factor there and the initial contact is easier if it's not face-to-face. -face. Also discuss the responsibilities of each party and the steps that will be taken once a report has been made. You really want to let your employees know, here's the process, this is what's going to happen. Um, we encourage you to, you know, report any incidents of sexual harassment, and we want you to know that this is, this is what's going to happen. So it, it really cuts down on that anxiety and fear that employees may have about reporting it if they know what they're getting into and they know how the process works. And also include all parties involved in the investigation. So if depending on how your company is structured and who all will be involved in the investigation, include everybody who might be involved in that process. I would also recommend a complaint resolution process. Provide an overview of the whole process, how it's filed, what's going to happen. You know, first you file it, uh, we will investigate it, we'll interview all the witnesses, we'll get back to you with the results. Um, you know, just an, again, a step-by-step -step on the complaint process itself. 
And then also a section on discipline. You definitely want to state the consequences for violating the uh, company's sexual harassment policy. You want to state it's a zero tolerance policy and that anybody found in violation of the policy will face disciplinary action up to and including termination. And then uh, you do want to talk about confidentiality. And in situations like this, you really can, can keep it confidential to a certain extent. And that's why I encourage putting this in the policy. Um, not to discourage people from reporting it, but just to let them know, hey, there might be, as the investigation moves along, there might be other people that we need to pull into this. So, you know, we'll, we'll be careful with who we let know, um, but there are other parties that might have to get involved just, to, you know, for witness sake. Also, it's very important to address retaliation. Uh, retaliation is prohibited under the uh, harassment laws. So you wanted to explain what retaliation is and that the company has a zero tolerance policy against retaliation and that anybody who um, you know, feels that they've been subject to retaliation needs to report it, who they should report it to, and that anybody who is retaliating against somebody who has either reported sexual harassment or participated in an investigation will face disciplinary action. And then I also encourage putting something in the policy about um, you know, false claims or refusal to cooperate are unacceptable and, and you can face disciplinary action for those two things as well. And of course, this list is not all inclusive. These are just the, the um, areas that I feel are very important. Uh, I have a lot of clients who add way more information because you know, it, it, it's, it's appropriate for their company. So tailor it to your needs and also make sure that you've checked your state um, regulations to make sure that you don't have any uh, additional requirements that would need to be added. So based on what I've covered, I recommend reviewing your company policy prohibiting sexual harassment and other types of unlawful harassment and seeing if you need to update that or improve it. Also review the complaint procedure for ease and clarity. You want to make it as easy as you can for the employee to report uh, sexual harassment and, and get to a resolution as quickly as possible. So um, look at that, see if you can make it easier, see if you can put more contact information in there. Just think about it from the employee's perspective when you're reading it. Educate all your employees about sexual harassment as well as your company policy. Educate first level supervisors on how to identify potential bad behaviors and how to handle a complaint of harassment. And also create an open discussion environment in which expectations are clear, but you can also answer questions and, and people aren't afraid of this issue. Now, of course, these steps won't prevent all cases, but at the very least, it educates your employees and they won't have the fear of bringing this up and talking about it. If you're interested in learning more about uh, sexual harassment, you can always go to the EEOC's website. They have tons of publications. They have uh, frequently asked questions. They have Q&A. Uh, there's tons of resources on their website. And of course, if you need assistance with your sexual harassment policy, procedures, or training, you can always contact me. Um, what questions do we have, if any? Any questions? Okay, I'm gonna stick around for a couple more minutes in case there are any questions. Again, I'm, I will email these slides to anyone. If you think of a question afterwards, feel free to email me. Thanks to everyone for attending today and watch for our upcoming uh, webinars in our newsletter next month. Okay, it doesn't look like we have any questions. People are falling off. I'll stick around for a few more minutes. Thanks, everyone.